we return. Hello, I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> Stream machine broke, but we return once more. How long have you been streaming for? Um, good question. I actually don't know. But, um, you haven't missed much. I might do a bit of a chat section later on, but at the moment we're going to go for the stupid idiots game that I love ever so much. One minute. Let me find it. it is a good game <laughs> and I very much enjoy it so uh, you may enjoy it too we'll have to see <laughs> um let's see where's my game cap just gone ah there they are okay we're good oh right I've broken character a lot today I do apologize you can see the VOD in which I was streaming yo <laughs> You can see the VOD where I, uh, kind of, sort of, debuted. I need to do a more serious... I'm live? Wow. Finally a week to catch the stream! Oh my gosh, yes. Welcome in, welcome in, welcome in! It's good to see you. <coughs> I don't know how laggy we are right now. Um, but hopefully not very. Difficult to tell. But, uh, because the VTubing model has been turned off, I would hope it's going to be better, but I don't know. <laughs> oh no. Oh, we're experiencing issues. Ah, but yes, thank you. I... If nothing else, and we can't play Sam and Max Save the World on stream, I can play it offline and then upload the VODs because that may be a bit less taxing on my PC. It's very uh, hit and miss at the moment. Oh, God. No, low, 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 low. Twelve eighty by seven twenty. <sighs> Alright, we've got quite a lot of skip frames. No, it's not just on your end. It's. Hang on, I may, I may need to send that in chat. If I- I'm going to be so upset if Sam and Max ends up being too demanding for my PC. Okay, how are we looking? Might be able to see it now, we shall see, we shall see. Right, okay. Hang on, let me see. Yeah, no, we're still experiencing issues. Ooh, not ideal, but, you know, gotta love this. I may just go back to doing just chatting and try and find a lower, <laughs> lower, less demanding game. Oh, and now it's in the corner. Oh, wonderful. You know what? I'll save it. I'll see. I'll play it offline or something. And we'll, we'll we'll do something else. L yeah, <laughs> I'm a bit annoyed because I really like the Sam and Max games, but it's okay. I can do something later. In the meantime, curse bananas, you missed the some of it, <laughs> but that's okay. Um, because honestly, I'm tired and I want to do it again because so much else has happened. Why is my game capture there? Oh, right. I will forewarn. I refuse to believe that game is that demanding. I know, right? <laughs> but I think part of it is down to the fact that my PC is just really bad. Maybe I'll play it on a different day and see if it'll work then. Perhaps it's just I need to, you know, properly turn off my PC for a good half an hour, let everything cool down. Who knows, but... I didn't know you were alive, I'm so sorry. <laughs> oh. Right. Oh, oh, he's green. Yeah, be warned. Uh, look away. It is green <laughs> right now. Uh, so, yeah, I know. Okay, just hang on. <laughs> I need to change the background. There we go. Oh. Oh, you can't see anything. Oh, good, actually. That's kind of good. Okay. Now we alt-tab. <laughs> it's 
It's my Discord name, so that low-key scares me, Lemayo. Do you game on a potato? I... I game on a gaming laptop. Okay, so just hold on a second, I need to... One minute. One minute, and... We return! Hello, right. Uh, some bumps in the road, some, uh, major issues. <laughs> we'll see how we go from here. Sorry, I had to drink some tea, and this doesn't have very good mouth tracking. This is kind of the default, uh, app that I think a lot of YouTubers use. Um, and I don't mind it, but at the same time as well, it can be very difficult to use, so. Ooh! <laughs> Hello! You can see the model. That's great. I'm, I'm, I'm pleased. I'm very pleased with this outcome. I'm pleased you appreciate good wine. I did get in character previously, but at the moment I'm very sort of, um, huh, very chaotic, you know. I, I, I'm so quirky. No, I'm just struggling. <laughs> That's the main- I'm struggling. Oh, skip frames. Oh, skip frames. Why the skip frames? Oh, okay. So, um, the big thing is, hi, um, <sighs> if you missed the proper kind of sort of debut, I need to turn, I need to switch my stream category, oh god. Just chatting, we're just chatting right now. And there is a VTuber involved. There we go. <laughs> oh, I did not go and prepared. I'm so sorry. Damn it, I have to go. No! Oh, that's a shame. Right, well, I'll see if I can find something less demanding. I'll catch you next stream. What's the lore about the little flying anime girl in the corner? That is the mascot for the people who made the software I'm using, and because I'm on the free version, because I don't have money. Also, I can't be bothered to spend it on this, <laughs> uh, on this when I can get the free version. It's just there. It's like a watermark, basically. But um, I don't particularly mind because I tend to put my avatar in the left-hand corner of the screen. So if I'm doing something that involves me having to use the VTuber while gaming, I can just put her out of the picture. It's fine. <laughs> oh, it makes a really weird face when I sip tea. Um... So that's the that's the that's the deal. That's that's <laughs> that's what we're doing. Um what backgrounds do I have? Oh. <laughs> um uh, it's, uh okay. Um background 3. Oh, that's green. That's very green. I don't like that. Oh. Yes. Oh my god. That is adorable. I just, damn. These are all the default backgrounds that come with this. Besides Grumb the Goo and Room, I think. Yes, Room's one I made myself. Um, a number of years ago. Uh, we shall go for... Pink. Simple. Pink. 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 <laughs> Drippy, yeah. Quite trippy indeed. Um, I want to do something, but I don't know what, so <laughs> I'm going to be quite just all over the place this stream, and I do apologise in advance, it's not going to be interesting, but you know, we can but try. Um, settings, how are we doing? Pretty okay. Okay. That's good. Also, funny thing with this is that you can add props to things, such as, like, soda, seven bucks. <laughs> yes, I, I do indeed like seven bucks. This is so large. This is a large boy. Ah! Oh god. Oh, you can pin them on the model, that's terrifying. Catch me <laughs> drinking my seven bucks. Well, that's... Uh, that's a thing. I think... hang on a second. 
sacrifice, so... <laughs> yes! Oh god, it's... I need to increase the size. There we go. No, go away. There we go. <laughs> oh, this is so stupid, I love it. <laughs> oh. oh dear. On the child. On the thing. Is that a child? I don't know if that's a child or not. I should not call things a child if they're not a child. But I do like... I'm very proud of the, the, the hair physics. I know it's very easy to do hair physics on models because it's just swing the hair back and forth. But uh, I like it, so... <laughs> I'm not very good at rigging, so any kind of, like, decent looking thing is just good to me, so... Yeah. Um. Oh, you know what I could do? I. It's a, yeah. That was a lot of coffee. I could read a ghost story with the model on. It wouldn't be very interesting, but it would be something. Uh, one second. You can load your own background images or movies by putting them into the background folder. YouTube Studio Data, Streaming Assets Background. Okay, that's good to know. I forgot how to do that, actually, so. Use this as a temporary fix while I go and grab a background. Ghost story now! <laughs> okay, we'll do a ghost story real quick. Um, I need a suitable background. One minute. I did make... You know what, never mind. We'll just, we'll just do it with... Um... Oh, 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 okay, okay, okay. This might not, oops, this might not work. We shall see. But is the green screen effect still on? And if so, will it mind out, by the way? Very loud, <laughs> loud color warning. Yes, okay, excellent. That's good, because it means I can just slap that and then I'm on my background. That's pretty cool. Okay. I'll just have to, uh, image... Change the transparency, I think. Can I do that? I can't. Never mind, it's fine. <laughs> I'll change the image to something else. Hmm. I don't have that many pictures that actually fit the aesthetic. <laughs> um... You know what? I will... Um... Hmm. I actually don't know what I will do. Just looking at some of the things that I have that I could possibly use as a background. Uh, and there are not very many things, so... Just go with it. I don't know why I'm whispering. Hmm... <laughs> We'll go with this one. Not quite the fitting- not quite completely fitting the aesthetic, but... It works. It's fine. Oh, I didn't mean to do that. That's fine, I just wanted to quickly do a little adjustment so that the little, little thing is out of the way. If I can, it's ah, being very fiddly. There we go. I am front and center. They are not here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. There we go. Look at this. <laughs> I look like I'm properly going to narrate. Okay. One last thing, then I'll give you a ghost story. I'm going to add some ambience. Haunted manor at night. ASMR ambience. Okay. Right, let me grab a book, and then we'll get our ghost stories on. One, two, three. Oh, 
gosh, I spilled tea everywhere. I hit my hip. I hit my desk with the hip. With my hip. <laughs> I'm so upset. Hold on. Nothing is going right for me today, unfortunately, which makes sense. <laughs> Apologize, you're going to hear some rumbling as I move my mic around. That'll do. It's enough. Right. Oh, she's still in the corner. Fuck off. <laughs> oh, God. Alright. Muddle, muddle, muddle. There. There. Should hopefully no longer vis be visible. Move Ooh. myself. Oh. <laughs> yes, it is very much an oof situation right now. Okay, there we are, front and center. Now I can finally <laughs> read the ghost story. We've got Ghosts of the Broads. <sighs> God. Right. <laughs> Let's actually read the story, shall we? Flip to something random. Hmm. We'll go for... Let's see... Semileton, okay. We'll put in here for the night, said Hubert, getting out, getting out the quant hook and a short hitcher, and turning to a fellow on the bank who seemed to have nothing to do and plenty of time to do it in. Called out, Hi George! Everybody's George to Hubert. Here, catch this and dig it in. The Hermione came alongside the bank and Hubert jumped ashore. You ain't stopping, exclaimed the yokel, with an anxious look on his face. Of course we are, replied Hubert, a little surprised. But not tonight. Why not? Why not indeed, don't you know? Hubert registered increased surprise and said, Well, what's the matter with tonight, anyway? Gradabor, he's about tonight. Gradabor? Gradabor? Who the heck is Gradabor? Gradabor, oh dear. <laughs> the rustic dropped his voice to a guttural whisper. Gradabor's the giant. He comes here every year, and he's expected tonight. Well, what is he? inquired Hubert. We're not afraid of giants. Then, turning to me, are we? Not on your life, I replied, pricking up both ears and scenting romance. Can't you see? went on the man. There's no boats here tonight. All gone. T all gone away till tomorrow. Here, yeah, I said, interrupting. I've been told on the best authority that the beer up at the inn is exceptionally good. Let's all go up there, George, and you shall tell us all about it. You will scarce believe it when I tell you that the man actually hesitated. But we prevailed upon him, and leaving the yacht in the tender care of the bank, we, that is Hubert Molyneux, the man and myself, proceeded to the pub, sat down in the old-fashioned bar, and primed George with a quart of the brownest. Come along now, George, I said. Tell us all about it. Never mind the others, I was very deeply interested. And this was the story. Gentlemen, tonight is the 17th of July, and everyone shuts himself up in his house, and early too. Fancy you never haven't heard of Grabador. Grabador was Blunderbore's twin. Blunderbore, you've heard of him? Well, he lived in the west down Cornwall way, and Grabador still lives in the east of England. And this is his home. All around here still lives. All around here is his hunting ground. He really lives by Fritton Decoy, and once a year he wakes up and stalks all over these parts, from Belton to St. Olaves, and down here to Blunderston March Marshes. Sorry. Having a bit of a day with stammering. <laughs> what sort of a giant is he, did you ask? Well, you can believe me or not, but when he walks about, those tall trees up on the hills are to him as blades of grass to you. If you was to stand in the palm of his hand, you'd think you were standing in the middle of an empty ballroom. All the year round he sleeps underground, and comes up once in a twelvemonth, like he will tonight for a spell and blow a fresh air. Every year it's the same, and the damage he does, it's no joke, I can tell you. Back about a hundred years ago, a man thought he would destroy this giant, and prepared a big pit and filled it with spikes like Jack the Giant Killer did when he killed Blunderbore. But Gradabore was ten times the size of Blunderbore, although they were twins, and one day he happened to come along whilst he, 
And one day he happened to come along whilst this huge pit was being dug, and when the man stopped to rest on his spade for a moment, he was struck temporarily dumb with fear. <sighs> for Grabador was sitting on the hill over there watching him. The giant was interested to see such a gargantuan work going on, and wondered what on earth it could be, and in his softest, gentlest tone, which shook the neighbourhood, inquired, Hello, what are you digging such a great pit for? Nothing, said the man, behaving most uncomfortable. Oh, ho, said the giant, his suspicions being roused at once, and thinking of what happened to his brother in Cornwall. This looks as though it is being prepared for me. He leaned forward and picked up the man between his finger and thumb, and stretching his arm at full length, he held the man up several thousand feet and squeezed him to death. He squeezed him so hard that not a particle of moisture was left in the body, and when he rubbed him between his fingers, the man's whole body was resolved to a powder, like as when you rub out a moth. His blood fell to the ground like red rain, and the spot where it just fell is known as Blood Man's Corner, which lies just over there behind the park and beyond Lound. Every year on the 19th of November, it rains a shower of blood there, in the daytime too, and a great shadow extends across the sky from the direction of Summer Layton. That's Gradibor's arm. When I was a nipper and inclined to be willful, I used to be told they would give me the giant. Give me to the giant. That did it. He sleeps over yonder, behind, beyond Fritton Decoy, and those large mounds at Mill Hill and Bell Hill, what you call Tumalusses, are due to, due to him underneath. He wakes up once a year and tramps around looking for food and drink. Sometimes he has the nightmares and snorts and grunts and the wind howls and the rain comes down like walking sticks. There used to be a village over near Bell Hill called Belton Minor, and one night he got up, shook himself, didn't look where he was stepping and the next morning it was gone, church and all. Pushed it right into the earth he did and not a soul was left to tell the tale. Many years ago, he woke up starving, and reached out he picked up Farmer Gorda's herd of Frisian cattle and ate them all at once at all blah, and ate them all one at a time and alive. Of course, one can't do anything. One wishes one could, but there you are, as the saying goes. If I was you, I wouldn't stay here tonight. Go away and come back tomorrow night if you like, but don't stay in these parts tonight. I'm only warning you. Yes, this is good ale, and I don't really mind if I do. Thank you very much for... What else did you ask? Do I know anything about him? Oh, lots. And turning to another agricultural labourer who was talking to some friends, said here, said, "Here, Shandy, I want you." The man in the question. <laughs> Sorry, let me restart that sentence. I'm running on a bit. Right. And turning to another agricultural labourer who was talking to some friends, said, "Here, Shandy, I want you." The man in question came over, and our informant and well wisher added. Tell them, Shandy. Tell these gentlemen about the giant. I don't think they quite believe me. Shandy cleared his throat, looked at his friend and then at us, and asked, Just arrived? Well, I wouldn't stay tonight if I was you. You never know. Is your boat tied up alongside? It is, but I get in it because it isn't worth it. Two years ago, he trod down all the reeds, but... Oh, hang on a second. Sorry. And I get in it and move away. You'll be down this way in a couple hours, boy. It isn't worth it. Two year ago, he trod all the, he trod down all the reeds between Blunderston and St. Elaves. Always walks by the river, he does. And I wouldn't be in a boat down this way when he goes by for a king's ransom, I wouldn't. Who is he? No one knows. But I've heard tell that he's in league with the old gentleman himself. Because a curious thing happens when he's coming. The church bells ring, peal after peal. No one in the village rings them. They, they rings of their own accord without no one touching them. When we hears them bells, we know it's a warning and he's on his way. One year he found a wherry unloading a ballast at the ferry, and he just picked it up and put it over on Braden, and when the fellas on board woke up in the morning, they found themselves where he'd put them overnight. I don't think he means no harm. He's just so big you can't see where he's going, and the damage he's causing. Don't you stay tonight more? If I was you, I'd put off and go down the Waveney a bit. The Waveney? Now that's interesting. The Waveney's not that wide, at least not where I am. Oh, don't you stay tonight, boar. If I was you, I'd go... <laughs> I'm going a bit wrong with the accent here. It's funny, I speak Norfolk. I'm having to push the accent because I've spoken in RP for so long. Yeah. You're old still. Pulling somewhere down there because he never crosses the water. He's never been known to go over to the other side of the river. You'd be perfectly safe there. Turning around, he called over Stingy, another friend of his. Stingy, what about old Grab Gradabor tonight? These gents here want to spend the night alongside, what say you? 
Stingy, a nice red-haired, pleasant-faced person, looked at us dubiously, scratched his scrubby chin, and said, You get away in good time, boy. Take my advice. Get over the other side of the water whilst you can. After tonight, you'll be all right. I've never seen him myself, but I've heard enough from them as I have. And I wouldn't stay this side of the river tonight for nothing. Wouldn't stay this side of the river tonight for nothing. I always goes across myself. Wouldn't catch me in summer late in tonight. I knows better than that. Where do you go? We asked, getting inquisitive. Well, there's generally some as goes across out the way, and I goes with them. Now look here, I said. You come aboard with us, and we'll push across to the other side, and sit up and watch him. How's that? Sounds all right, boar. You come too, maggot. He, he, addressing the first man. Sorry. Well, I don't mind. Shandy'll come too, he replied. Shandy took a deal of coaxing. But eventually it was agreed that, for a dollar apiece, three men would come with us to the place to the opposite side of the river and spend the night. We took a gallon jar of ale with us, and we all went aboard. There were Shandy, Stingy, and Maggot, Hubert, Molyneux, and myself, so we made a merry party and repaired to the yacht, where we threw a spread of bully omelette, cheese and beer, and some canned fruit to follow, tailing off with coffee and apples. The meal was a great success, and to see these hefty men eat was, was a sight to be remembered. You'd have, to th you'd have thought they hadn't had a square meal in for years. Oof, I'm stammering a bit, I do apologise. After supper, we untied our bowline, and pushed across to the opposite bank right into the reeds, whilst one of the men hopped ashore and pushed our quant, quant hook onto the turf. It was certainly a weird night. One of those nights when anything could happen, and our three guests were decidedly uneasy. Oh, let me move the book real quick. <laughs> Their extraordinary behaviour when we first met them, I felt, was perhaps due to a little local vanity, giving them the opportunity of setting their stage and performing not only for our edification, but their, but their own. But it wasn't so after all. They were genuinely squeamish about the whole thing, and I changed my opinion. But I could not make out their conception of the supergiant, which evidently had some basis of truth, if it wasn't easy to fathom or trace its origin. Here were three hefty men, with certainly no axes to grind, all genuinely terrified of this... Oh my word. Brobding Nasian monster whom they credited with the most horrifying misdeeds, and evidently a very useful person unto whom they could lay the blame for anything and everything that went wrong. In, or in any way that went amiss with them. One very certain fact was that whatever, whoever, or whenever this colossus of inquiry was, his presence in these parts did not seem bad enough to cause them to evacuate his territory. You or I would have very quickly removed our lairs and pennants to a more acceptable and peaceful part, and seeing that on the other side of the river one could be quite safe, it is curious that they still remained in the danger zone when by a very little effort they could have preserved themselves from the annual risk of complete extermination. The night was clear, the stars twinkled and shone brightly in the promise of a fine morrow, and not a fleck was in the sky. George sat over a line with the float on it to beguile the hours of waiting, and we all sat around in the saloon and smoked. What a perfect evening it was. The river glided by in silent sympathy, and a gentle zephyr, Sowing quietly through the reeds, lightly fanned our faces when we came inside. We had come up now and were lolling on the deck, and presently a breeze sprang up. It blew from the east and moaned as it greeted the trees around us. Suddenly, it grew and grew until it blew with almost hurricane force. The sky had clouded partly over, and the moaning of the wind and the trees, like a lost soul trying to find its way home, gave place to a slight misgiving that our calculations for the weather forecast were going to let us down. There was a long, deep rumble in the distant sky, and intermittent flashes illuminated the eastern heavens. The rumblings increased in intensity, and the sinister nimbus that came up from the horizon had by now stolen stealthily overhead, and extended far away into the southwest. The stars were gone, and the night became stuffy and the air like sponge. Woof! Woof! Several blinding flashes lighted up everything around us, and the crashes nearly split our ears. The sky began to weep, and presently huge drops were falling, and in less than a minute it was raining long hitches, fire irons, and fishing rods. 
It came down as I have never seen it before in England. It was real tropical rain, and the terrific wind spread it out like a water curtain in a theatre. It was almost impossible to remain on deck, so we had foregathered once more in the saloon. Then someone asked, Where's Maggot? Where's Stingy? Where's Shandy? But there was no need to ask. At the first clap of thunder they had bolted as one man off the yacht and away across the meads. Where they went it is impossible to say, but I'll, st I'll stake my solemn Davy it wasn't to their homes across the water. Gradibor certainly did his stuff properly, and with a vengeance, for he had walked very thoughtfully through the park, levelling some very fine old trees in his stride. Some people are so careless. The following day broke finer than ever, with a Neapolitan sky overhead, and everything looking very much the fresher for the good wash down it had overnight. So we crossed the river once more, tied up along the ferry, and went up to the pub. There were no there were our friends of the night before, and full of it. Well, I said, addressing Maggot, you're a fine crowd and no mistake, leaving us there in the lurch like that and running for your lives. Oh bore, exclaimed Stingy, trying to placate us with a stupid belief. We thought he was coming across and we nipped it. What about us? I replied, feeling very annoyed at the fellow's cheek. Oh, he replied, you would never understand. He come right down across the park, did a lot of damage he did. Then he stumped right down the marshes all along by the river, and then went home. And we'll... And will you believe me, he looked me straight in the eyes as he said it, and appeared to lend his own conviction to everything he said. Anyway, if you're ever down Summer Leighton way on over at 17th of July, keep a good look keep a good look out for Grabador, and don't forget, well, the other side of the river. There you go. There's a little ghost story for you. Or more of a giant story, really, but that part about the raining blood in a very specific location is very fascinating. There you go. There's a little ghost story for you. I might get a more conventional ghost story book out in a minute, but I don't remember where I put it. Sorry, my leg click. One minute. I'll be with you in a second. I'm going to try not to kick the desk this time. Okay. We've got Haunted Norwich, and then we can also do a dramatic reading of The Woman in Black, if you want. Or, oh, I had an idea. Okay, so, why don't we, one moment, why don't I give you all a little treat in the form of, well, you all know that I am a vampire. That is very clear. <laughs> so how about, if I can find it, I read some classical vampire literature. Does that sound good? I imagine it might. One moment. Why don't I give you all a dramatic reading of the classic vampire literature? It's unfortunately, my desk is getting a bit of abuse. Not intentionally, mind you, so... <laughs> Introduction. We'll skip past the introduction. We'll simply start the book from the beginning. Okay. I don't know how long we'll go, but let's. Oh. Reading. Bram. 
Bone Stokers. Dracula. And I suppose this could be classed as a podcast. Because I don't believe they have a uh, category for reading aloud yet, so we shall have to settle. Anyway. Allow me to attempt to read an excerpt from Bram Stoker's Dracula. How far we'll go in the book, I am not entirely certain, but it's always worth having a look. Right. Let us begin. Bear in mind as well, a lot of this is... Oh dear, sorry. <laughs> a lot of this is in shorthand, therefore it may be a little bit difficult for me to read aloud, but I'll do my best. Okay. Chapter 1. Jonathan Harker's Journal. Kept in shorthand. 3rd of May, Bitstritz. Left Munich at 8.35pm on the 1st of May, arriving at Vienna early next morning. Should have arrived at 6.46, but the train was an hour late. Budapest seems a wonderful place, from the glimpse which I got of it from the train and the little I could walk through the streets. I feared to go very far from the station, as we had arrived late and would start as near the correct time as possible. The impression I had was that, the, was that we were leaving the west and entering the east, the most western of splendid bridges across, over the Danube, which here is of noble width and depth, took us among the traditions of Turkish rule. We left in pretty good time, and came after nightfall, nightfall to Clausenborough. Here I stopped for the night at Hotel Royale. I had for dinner, or rather supper, a chicken done up some way with red pepper, which was very good, but thirsty. Memo, get recipe for Mina. I asked the waiter, and he said it was called paprika handel, and that, as it was the national dish, I should be able to get it anywhere among the Carpathians. I found my smattering of German very useful here indeed. I don't know how I should be able to get on without it. Having some time at my disposal when in London, I had visited the British Museum, and made search among the books and maps of the library regarding Transylvania. It had struck me that some foreknowledge of the country could hardly fail to have some importance in dealing with the noble of that country. I find that the distinct... Hmm, the district he named is in the extreme east of the country, just on the borders of the three states, Transylvania, Moldavia, and Bokoniva, in the midst of the Carpathian Mountains. One of the wildest and least known portions of Europe. I apologise if I've mispronounced anything. Please let me know. Let's see, where was I? I was not able to light on any map or work giving the exact locality of the Castle Dracula, as there are no maps of this country as yet to compare with our own Ordnance Survey maps. But I found that Bistritz, the post town, named by Count Dracula, is a fairly well-known place. I shall enter here some of my notes, as they may refresh the memory when I talk about talk over my travels with Mina. In the population of Transylvania, there are four distinct nationalities. Saxons in the south, and mixed in with them the Wallachs, who are the descendants of the Dacians, Magyars in the west, and Sicilius in the east and north. I am going among the latter, who claim to be descended from Attila and the Huns. This may be so, for when the Magyars conquered the country in the 11th century, they found the Huns settled in it. I read that every known superstition in the world is gathered into the horseshoe of the Carpathians, as if it were the centre of some sort of imaginative whirlpool. If so, my stay may be very interesting. Memo, I must ask the Count all about them. I did not sleep well, though, my bed... I did not sleep well, though my bed was comfortable enough, for I, for I had all sorts of queer dreams. There was a dog howling all night long under my window, which may have had something to do with it, uh, which may have had something to do with it, or it may have been the paprika, for I had to drink up all the water in my carafe and was still thirsty. Towards morning I slept and was wakened by the continuous knocking at my door, so I guessed I must have been sleeping soundly then. I had for breakfast more paprika and a sort of porridge of maize flour, which they said was mum, mama, and eggplant stuffed with force meat. A very excellent dish, which they call imp implitata. Memo, get recipe for this also. 
I had to hurry breakfast, for the train started a little before eight, or rather it ought to have done so, for after rushing to the station at 7.30 I had to sit in the carriage for more than an hour before we began to move. It seems to me that the further east you go, the more unpunctual are the trains. What ought to they be in China? All day long we seemed to dawdle through a country which was full of beauty of every kind. Sometimes we saw little towns or castles on by the top of steep hills such as in old missiles. Such as we see in old missiles. Sometimes we ran by rivers and streams which seemed to be from the wide stony margin on each side of them to be subject to great floods. It takes a lot of water, and running strong, to sweep outside the edge of a river clear. <laughs> Let's see, where was I? At every station there were groups of people, sometimes crowds, and in all sorts of attire. Some of them were just peasants at home. Just like peasants at home, sorry. <laughs> Some of them were just like peasants at home. Or those I saw coming through France and Germany, with short jackets and round hats and homemade trousers. But others were very picturesque. The women looked pretty, except when you got near them, but they were all very clumsy about the waist. Hmm, this doesn't read well nowadays. They had all full white sleeves of some kind or another, and most of them had big belts with lots of strips or something fluttering from them like the dresses in a ballet, but of course petticoats under them. The strangest figures we saw were the Slovaks, who were more barbarian than the rest. This reads very poorly. <laughs> if you wish, I may skip past this bit. I uh, do not feel comfortable reading out how funny Jonathan Harker thinks other cultures are. Ah, there we go. I found a bit that's less. It was on the dark side of twilight when we got to Bistritz, which is a very interesting old place. Being practically on the frontier, for the Borgo Pass leads, it from, leads from it into Bukovnia. Bukovina, sorry. It had a very stormy existence, and it certainly shows marks of it. Fifty years ago, a series of great fires took place, which made terrible havoc on five separate occasions. At the very beginning of the 17th century, it underwent a siege of almost three weeks and lost 13,000 people. The casualties of war, proper being assisted by famine and disease. Count Dracula had directed me to go to the Golden Crone Hotel, which I found, to my delight, to be thoroughly old-fashioned. For, of course, I wanted to see all I could of the ways of the country. I was evidently expected, for when I got near the door I faced a cheery-looking elderly woman in the usual pleasant peasant dress. White undergarment with long double apron, front and back, of coloured stuff fitting almost too tight for modesty. Hmm. When I came close, she bowed and said, The Herr Englishman? Yes, I said. Jonathan Harker. She smiled and gave some message to an elderly man in white shirt sleeves, who had followed her to the door. He went, but immediately returned with a letter. My friend, welcome to the Carpathians. I am anxiously expecting you. Sleep well tonight. At three tomorrow, the diligence will start for Bukovina. A place on it is kept for you. At the Borgo Pass, my carriage will await you and bring, will bring you to me. I trust that your journey from London has been a happy one, and that you will enjoy your stay in my beautiful land. Your friend, Dracula. My apologies for the book ASMR. I need to flip the page. <laughs> Fourth of May. I found that my landlord had got a letter from the Count, directing him to secure the best place on the coach for me, but on making inquiries as to details he seemed somewhat reticent, and pretended that he could not understand my German. This could not be true, because up to then he had understood it perfectly, at least he answered my questions exactly as if he did. He and his wife, the old lady who had received me, looked at each other in a frightened sort of way. He mumbled out that the money had been sent in a letter, and that that was all he knew. When I asked him if he knew Count Dracula, and could tell me of anything of his castle, both he and his wife crossed themselves, and saying that they knew nothing at all, simply refused to speak further. It was so near the time of starting that I had no time to ask anyone else, for it was all very mysterious and not by any means company, comforting. Just before I was leaving, the old lady came up to my room and said in a very hysterical way, must you go? Oh, young hare, must you go? She was in such an excited state that she seemed to have lost grip of what German she knew, and mixed it all up with some other language which I did not know at all. 
I was just able to follow her by asking many questions when I told her that I must go at once, and that I was engaged on important business, she asked again, Do you know what day it is? I answered that it was the 4th of May. She shook her head as she said again, Oh yes, I know that, I know that, but do you know what day it is? On my saying that I did not understand, she went on, It is the eve of St. George's Day. Do you not know that tonight, when the clock strikes midnight, all the evil things in the world will have full sway? Do you know where you are going, and what you are going to? She was in such evident distress that I tried to comfort her, but without effect. Finally, she went down on her knees and implored me not to go, at least wait a day or two before starting. It was all very ridiculous, but I did not feel comfortable. However, there was business to be done, and I could allow nothing to interfere with it. I therefore tried to raise her up, and said as gravely as I could, that I thanked her, but my duty was imperative, and that I must go. She then rose and dried her eyes, and taking a crucifix from her neck, offered it to me. I did not know what to do, for as an English churchman, I have been taught to regard such things in some measure idolatrous. As some measure idolatrous. And yet it seemed so ungracious to refuse an old lady meaning so well and in such a state of mind. She saw, I suppose, the doubt in my face, for she put the rosary round my neck and said, For your mother's sake, and went out the room. I am writing up this part of the diary whilst I am waiting for the coach, which is, of course, late, and the crucifix is still around my neck. Whether it is the old lady's fear, I do not know, but I am not feeling nearly as easy in the mind as usual. If this book should never reach Mina, bef should ever reach Mina before I do, let it bring my goodbye. Here comes the coach. On the 5th of May, the castle. The grey of the, the gray of the morning has passed, and whether the sun is high over the distant horizon, which seems jagged, whether with trees or hills I do not know, for it is so far off that big things and little are mixed. I am not sleepy, and, as I am to be called till I awake, uh, as I am not to be called till I awake, apologies, naturally I write till sleep comes. There are many odd things to put down. And lest who reads from who reads them may fancy that I dined too well before I left Bistritz. Let me put down my dinner exactly. I dined on what they call robber steak, bits of bacon, onion, and beef, seasoned with red pepper, and strung on sticks and roasted over the fire, in the simple style of the London's cat's meat. The wine was golden midiash, which produces a queer sting on the tongue, which is, however, not disagreeable. I only had a couple of glasses of this, and nothing else. When I got on the coach, the driver had not taken his seat, and I saw him talking with the landlady. They were evidently talking of me, for every now and then they looked at me, and some of the people who were sitting on the bench outside the door, which they call by a name meaning word-bearer, came and listened, and then they looked at me, most of them pityingly. I could hear a lot of words often repeated, queer words, for there were many nationalities in the crowd, so I quietly got my polyglot dictionary from my bag and looked them out. I must say, they, they were not cheering for me, for amongst them was Ordog, Satan, Pokol, Hell, Stregoica, Witch, Vrolok, and Vlos... Vlkosak, both of which mean the same thing, one being Slovak and the other Servian for something that was either werewolf or vampire. Memo, I must ask the Count about these superstitions. When we started, the crowd round the, crowd round the inn door, which had by this po time swelled to a considerable side, size, oof, sorry, <laughs> all made the sign of the cross and pointed two fingers towards me. With some difficulty, I got a fellow passenger to tell me what they meant. He would not answer at first, but on learning that I was English, he explained that it was a charm or guard against the evil eye. This was not very pleasant for me, just starting for an unknown place to meet an unknown man, but everyone seemed so kind-hearted and so sorrowful and so sympathetic that I could that I could not but be touched. I shall never forget the last glimpse which I had of the inn yard and its crowd of picturesque figures, all crossing themselves as they stood round the wide archway with its background of rich foliage and ore oleander, and the orange trees and green tubs clustered in the centre of the yard. Then our driver, whose wide linen drawers covered the whole of the front box seat, Gotza they called them, cracked his big whip over his four small horses, which ran abreast, and we set off on our journey. 
I soon lost sight and recollection of the ghostly fears and the beauty of the scene as we drove along. Although had I known the language, or rather languages, which my fellow passengers were speaking, I might not have been able to throw them off so easily. Before us lay a green sloping land full of forests and woods, with here and there steep hills crowned with clumps of trees or filled with farmhouses, the blank gable end to the road. The blank, yes, the blank gable end to the road. There was everywhere a bewildering mass of fruit blossom, apple, plum, pear, cherry. As, and as we drove by, I could see the green grass under the trees spangled with the fallen petals. In and out amongst these green hills of what they call here the Middle Land, ran the road, losing itself as it swept around the grassy curve, or was shut out by the straggling ends of pine woods, which here and there ran down the hillsides like tongues of flame. The road was rugged, but we still seemed to fly over it with feverish haste. I could not, I could not understand then what the haste meant, but the driver was evidently bent on losing no time in reaching Bor Borgo Prond. I was told that this road is in summertime excellent, but that it had not yet been put in order after the winter snows. In this respect, it is different from the general run of the roads in the Carpathians, for it is an old tradition that they are not to be kept in too good order. Of old, the hospodars would not repair them, lest the Turks should think that they were preparing to bring in foreign troops, and so hasten the war which was already really at loading point. Always really at loading point. Beyond the green swelling hills of the middle land rose mighty slopes of forest up to the lofty steeps of the Carpathians themselves. Right and left of us they towered, with the afternoon sun falling upon them, and bringing out all the glorious colours of this beautiful range. Deep blue and purple in the shadows of the peaks, green and brown where grass and rock mingled, and an endless perspective of jagged rock and pointed crags, till these were themselves lost in the distance, where snowy peaks rose grandly. Here and there seemed mighty rifts in the mountains, through which, as the sun began to sink, we saw now and again the white gleam of falling water. One of my companions touched my arm as we swept round the base of a hill and opened up the lofty, snow-covered peak of the mountain, which seemed, as we wound up on our serpentine way, to be right before us. Look, Yishten Snek, God's seat! And he crossed us, and he crossed himself reverently. As we wound on our endless way, and the sun sank lower and lower behind us, the shadows of the evening began to creep round us. This was emphasised by the fact that the snowy mountain tops still held the sunset, and seemed to glow out with a delicate cool pink. Here and there we passed Czechs and Slovaks, all in picturesque attire, but I noticed that Goitub was painfully prevalent. By the roadside there were many crosses, and as we swept by, my companions all crossed themselves. Here and there was a peasant man or woman kneeling before a shrine, who did not even turn around as we approached, but seemed in the self-surrender of devotion to have neither eyes nor ears for the outer world. There were many things new to me, for instance, hayricks in the trees, here, and here and there very beautiful masses of weeping birch, their white stems shining like silver through the delicate green of the leaves. Now and again we passed a lighter wagon, the ordinary peasant's cart, with its long, snake-like vertebra, calculated to suit the inequalities of the road. On this we were sure to be seated, and the Slovaks with their... Oh. On this were sure to be seated quite a group of homecoming peasants, the Czechs with their white and the Slovaks with their coloured sheepskins, the latter carrying lance fashion in their long staves with axe at end. As the evening fell it began to get very cold and the growing twilight seemed to merge into one dark mistiness in the gloom of the trees. Oak, beech, and pine. Though in the valleys which ran deep between the spurs of the hills as we ascended through the pass, the dark firs stood out here and there against the background of late-lying snow. Sometimes, as the road was cut through the pine woods that seemed in the darkness to be closing down upon us, great masses of grayness which here and there bestrewed the trees produced a peculiarly weird and solemn effect, which carried on thoughts and grim fancies and engendered earlier in the evening, when the falling sunset threw into strange relief the ghost-like clouds which amongst the Carpathians seemed to, wind ceaselessly, seemed to wind ceaselessly through the valleys. Sometimes the hills were so steep that, despite our driver's haste, the horses could only go slowly. I wished to get down and walk up them, as we do at home, but the driver would not hear of it. No, no, he said, you must not walk here. The dogs are too fierce. And then he added, 
with what evidently meant for grim pleasantry, for he looked round to catch the approving smile of the rest. And you may have enough of such matters before you go to sleep. The only stop he would make was a moment's pause to light his lamps. When it grew dark, there seemed to be some excitement amongst the passengers, and they kept speaking to him one after the other as though urging him to further speed. He lashed, he lashed the horses unmercifully with his long lip, whip, and with wild cries of encouragement urged them on to further exertions. Then, through the darkness, I could see a sort of patch of grey light ahead of us, as though there were a cleft in the hills. The excitement of the passengers grew greater. The crazy coach rocked on its great leather springs and swayed like a boat tossed on a stormy sea. I had to hold on. The road grew more level, and we appeared to fly along. Then the mountains seemed to come nearer to us on each side and to frown down upon us. We were entering the Borgo Pass. One by one, several of the passengers offered me gifts, which they pressed upon me with earnestness which would take no denial. These were certainly of an odd varied kind, but each was given in simple good faith, with a kindly word and a blessing, and that strange mixture of fear-meaning movements which I had seen outside the hotel at Bistritz, the sign of the cross and the guard against the evil eye. Then, as we flew along, the driver leaned forward, and on each side of the passengers, craning over the edge of the coach, peered eagerly into the darkness. It was evident that something very exciting was either happening or expected, but though I asked each passenger, no one would give me the slightest expectation. This state of excitement kept on for some little time, and at last we saw before us the pass opening out onto the eastern side. There were dark, rolling clouds overhead, and in the air the heavy, oppressive sense of thunder. It seemed as though the mountain range had separated two atmospheres, and that now we had got into the thunderstorms one, the thunderous one, my apologies. I was now myself looking out for the conveyance which was to take me to the Count. Each moment I expected to see the glare of lamps through the blackness, but all was dark. The only light was the flickering rays of our own lamps, in which steam from our hard-driven horses rose in a white cloud. We could now see the sandy road lying white before us, but there was no- but the, sorry. But there was on it no sign of a vehicle. The passengers drew back with a sigh of gladness, which seemed to mock my own disappointment. I was already thinking what I had best do, when the driver, looking at his watch, said to the others it's something which I could hardly hear. It was spoken so quietly and in so low a tone, I thought it was an hour less than the time. Then turning to me, he said in German worse than my own, There is no carriage here. The hare is not expected after all. He will now come on to Bukovina, and return tomorrow or the next day, better than next day. Whilst he was speaking to the horses, whilst he was speaking, the horses began to neigh and snort and plunge wildly, so that the driver had to hold them up. Then, amongst a chorus of screams from the peasants and universal crossing of themselves, a kalesh with four horses drove up behind us, overtook us, and drew up beside the coach. I could see from the flash of our lamps as the rays fell on them that the horses were coal-black and splendid animals. They were driven by a tall man with a long brown beard and a great black hat, which seemed to hide his face from us. I could only see the gleam of a pair of very bright eyes, which seemed red in the lamplight as he turned to us. He said to the driver, "'You are early tonight, my friend,' the man stammered in reply. "'The English hare was in a hurry,' to which the stranger replied. That is why, I suppose, you wished him to go on to Bukovina. You cannot deceive me, my friend. I know too much, and my horses are swift. As he spoke, he smiled. The lamplight fell on a hard-looking mouth with very red lips and sharp-looking teeth, as white as ivory. One of my companions whispered to another, the line from Burgers Lenore, for the dead, for the dead travel fast. The strange driver evidently heard the words, for he looked up with a gleaming smile. The passenger turned his face away at the same time, putting out his two fingers and crossing himself. "'Give me Hare's luggage,' said the driver, and with exceeding al alacrity my bags were handed out and put in the calèche. Then I descended from the side of the coach, as the calèche was close alongside, the driver helping me with a hand which caught my arm in a grip of steel. His strength must have been prodigious. Without a word, he shook his reins, the horses turned, and we swept into the darkness of the pass. As I looked back, I saw the steam from the horses of the coach by the light of the lamps. 
and projected against it the figures of my late companions crossing themselves. Then the driver cracked his whip and called to his horses, and they swept on their way to Bukovina. As they sank into the darkness, I felt a strange chill, and a lonely feeling came over me. But a cloak was thrown over my shoulders, and a rug across my knees, and the driver said in excellent German, The night is chill, my nerve, and the master of the count bade me to take bade me take care Ooh, sorry. The night is chill, mein Herr, and the ma my master the count bade me take all care of you. There is a flask of Sliv Slivovitz, the plum brandy of the country, underneath the seat, if you should require it. I did not take any, but it was a comfort to know it was there all the same. I felt a little strange, and not a little frightened. I think, had there been any alternative, I should have taken it instead of prosecuting that unknown night journey. The carriage went at a hard pace straight along, then we made a complete turn and went along another straight road. It seemed to me that we were simply going over and over the same ground again, and so I took note of some salient point and found that this was so. I would have liked to have asked the driver what this all meant, but I really feared to do so, for I thought that, placed as I was, any protest would have no effect in the case there had been an intention to delay. By and by, however, as I was curious to know how time was passing, I struck a match and by its flame looked at my watch. It was within a few hours of midnight. This gave me a sort of shock, for I suppose the general superstition about midnight was increased by my recent experiences. I waited with a sick feeling of suspense. That'll do for tonight, I think. We managed to get about... several pages into Dracula. I'm going to see if I can read the rest of this on stream at some point or another. Um, but I'm glad that we did this. I'm glad that this was a sort of bit of a scuffed debut. I'll probably end up re-debuting when I have a better voice and um, personality in mind, but um, this has been fun and I would love to do this again. Thank you everyone so much who came along. It was wonderful to see you all again and I will see you on Wednesday, hopefully. Goodbye.